Well, it's great to be with you. Great to start in on our word for this morning. It's just a standalone message. Been really excited by what the Lord has been doing recently. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember, but October time, just around about one conference, I began speaking about how the Lord was going to move us into a new season where the Holy Spirit was going to start moving amongst His people in really significant ways. And on the face of it, the surface of church life has definitely changed. We've seen a real engagement with people in terms of worship. We've seen a real openness to the things of the Holy Spirit. And we're starting to hear back on an individual level some of the significant stories that have been happening since October. You remember when I told you about the people that got baptized down the beach? Two of them said that they expressly had an encounter with God that night that Trina Madar was here preaching in October. And life has not been the same for them. And we've seen our youth go away to camp and been uh, amongst the leaders standing up to worship God in spirit and truth at Easter camp. And now as we're heading into 50th birthday, I can't wait to see all that God is going to be doing amongst us. In just about five weeks' time now, we're going to be celebrating our 50th birthday as a church. And I'm really looking forward to our guest speaker who's going to be here. His name's Colin Dye. It's his first time in New Zealand. Um, and he was my boss over in London, so I think we've got a photo on that one, jo uh, Joey. Uh, he was my boss over in London, so he was the former leader of the largest Elam church that there's been, um, and I served with him for 15 years uh, before coming over here. I learned and trained under him, and in a very real way, they used to call us father and son. Um, but it's super exciting to have him coming over here. I can't tell you the fullness of the prophetic word, but there was a word shared before we moved over here, and I think it's really going to be a significant time as God does something in the church and also in the region of Otago and beyond. So we're inviting you to place 17, 18, 19th May in your diary as a time where you're going to be here in the church. It's going to be crazy packed. I don't know how we're going to do it, but everyone wanted to be in the building to celebrate what God has done in this church over the last 50 years. So we'll just have to have seats up to the front and all the way to the back and the doors open and people standing out on the road. We're going to have to fill up everywhere that we possibly could to bring people to celebrate what God's done. But if you do know someone who is here and would want to be part of that, let them know. There's more information on our website as well. But I thought today's word would be a great uh, continuation from our ministry with Aaron Hardy last week. Uh, it was so great to see a hunger for the, uh, the word of the Lord from people and, and the response of people at the end of the service to come out and to respond to Aaron's ministry. I was so grateful for him feeling led to operate in the prophetic space, particularly personal prophecy. But you also know he's a songwriter. That last song we sang, To Here, was one of the songs that came out of his church. It's super important for us to have a mix of spiritual gifts speaking into the life of the church, both from an internal point of view, but also externally. And the thing that I think really spoke to me was his word on um, God wanting to minister to those that are bruised and broken, those that have been hurt by church life or hurt by situations and circumstances, but particularly in a context of choosing to be set apart to God. And that, you know, the challenge that we face is that so often we can think that God is the one that's orchestrating our situation. God is the one seeking to snuff out the light of our life. But what he was bringing was that perspective that actually your situation is seeking to snuff out the life of God in you. But God is for you. He's for you being released into all that he has for you in healing and in restoration as we choose to be set apart to the Lord. Now, he made a reference to a Nazarite vow, and I thought, I remember the Nazarite vow. I did a Nazarite vow back in the day one time, and um, that photo on the right was a 100-day Nazarite season. It's terrible. But I had to, you know, as, when you come to the end of your season... You then uh, have to shave all your head up, hair off. Um, so I thought, you know, that was a great reminder for me. I thought there was a lot of other stuff he was talking about. But the group I started in was called the Nazarites over at KT in London. So it was just a great encouragement to me in that space as we step into all that God has for us. While we're looking at silly photos, this is uh, proof that I, uh, I can fast. That was, that was a 40-day fast photo after that. And then the next one was just another crazy photo where I was inspired to buy new trousers. Um, now, there is a strange excitement that stirs in our hearts when we think that God is speaking in a room, when we 
re- recognize that there are people that are prophesying and people that are speaking, and it can happen every week where we hear from the Lord. But I know something specific happened last week. It felt like prayer lifted in the room as Aaron was just speaking. And some of you were praying like this. Be honest with me now. Lord, don't let him pick me. <laughs> He's pointing at people saying, you in the blue and you in the red and you sitting at the back. And you're like, Jesus, I don't want a word. Please pass me by. Please pass me by. Some of you, be honest with me, please. But there were others of you who got your holy moment on. You know how it goes when someone's walking around the room and they're prophesying and you're like, where are they, where are they, where are they? Okay, Okay, they're coming close. Jesus, I love you. Are they going to come and pray for me? Jesus, I need a word today. Are any of you doing that? No. Surely we wouldn't acknowledge that. But, you know, the point is that we all get excited when God starts to speak in a room. It's an opportunity for us to really be open to the Holy Spirit. And so I thought I'd speak today on what it is to give and receive a prophetic word. We'll start with a brief theological base in this place. First, it's recognizing that God is the speaking God. In John 1, we have in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You've got it there for you. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness hasn't overcome it. I just got a different version in my text, so I thought I should read that one. But this is echoing the origins, uh, the prophetic origins of the universe in Genesis. We see in Genesis, and then we see again reflected in Jesus' arrival, the power of God is linked indelibly to the Word of God. We see when the Word of God goes forth that the power of God goes forth accordingly. And not only has God spoken in the beginning and continued to speak through Jesus, but right from the beginning, even through till now, from the Alpha and to the Omega that is yet to come, that time which is ahead, God has been speaking to His people, bringing a unique flavor to the universe in which we live. And the God who knows the end from the beginning is able to give advanced insight into what he is going to do. And for example, the life of Jesus is believed that he fulfilled at least 300 prophecies in his one life here on the earth. The odds of doing that are astounding. Just eight is in the several million to one. 300 fulfilled in the life of one individual is impossible apart from God. But God speaks and continues to speak, and has done from times past and into times future. And it's so important for us to know that, because what it's saying is that God interacts with the very real world that we live in. God speaking helps us make sense when we wonder what's happening in the world, when we wonder about the various wars in Ukraine and in Gaza, when we're worried about climate change, when we're worried about the impact of natural disasters and famine, God's word makes a difference when you're facing redundancy. God's difference makes, the word makes a difference when you're facing a personal trial that makes no sense to you. It's so important to know that God is speaking even when he's silent. And I want to just emphasize that for us this morning, that his silence is as significant as his words. So often we make the assumption, simply because we're not aware of his presence, that he's not there, but God is so consistently present in every single situation that we face, and he's speaking into those situations, even with his presence, even with his nearness. But there does come times where he does speak to us and let us know what he's doing. I just want to set this in a wider context. So I've been walking with the Lord now for 20 years, and I would say that If I were to think about the number of significant words that I've received for my life, it would probably be about five. So that might be one every four or five years. So it's not like we're sitting down and like God is speaking every five seconds and you're like getting revelation all the time. We're hearing from God over the seasons and, and times of our life as we move into the different spaces that he's calling us to. But knowing he's speaking or even being with him in his silence is so helpful. I just thought I'd chuck this slide up briefly on prophetic loyalty, but actually I feel that this is a great word in and of itself another, another time. But um, 
there is a season of planting, there's a season of trusting, there's a season where that fruit that, or that plant that has been uh, put in the ground is quickened to bear fruit, and then there's the season when we're living out of the fruitfulness of that uh, word. And each have a different response. I'll come back to this another time because I think for us today we're challenged a little bit with time. Um, but I believe that I'm, I'm saying this word prophetic loyalty because actually if God is speaking to us, if he has a word for us, it's incumbent on us, it's necessary for us to take that word and remain faithful as we can be from our side. There are times when you'll feel faithless. There are times when you'll feel faithful. But as, as much as possible to cling to the word of God as the most precious gift that he can give you as an individual. That his promise over your life, his direction for your life is so essential and key. Now, in the coming um, year, we'll have opportunity to return to and look at how we can develop structures around enabling and empowering the prophetic gift. You'll hear in just a moment that it's possible for all of us who are filled with the Spirit of God to prophesy. Uh, but there's a distinction between our capacity to prophesy and the recognition of a gift of prophecy resting on someone, and then another level, the recognition of the office of a prophet. So we'll look at those in other times. But today, I want to speak to you in two broad areas, the giving of a word and the receiving of a word from God. Now, first, let me just set out for you, who can be a prophet? In, in Old Testament times, it was possible for a prophet to be distinguished by the word that they would bring, and often there would be a classification of prophet as distinct to priest, as distinct to king, but a prophet being one anointed by the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit's available in Old Testament times in limited function in people's lives, resting upon people and only specific, well-identified people. But we see a significant shift in New Testament. What we see following Jesus returning to heaven is the day of Pentecost. And we've deliberately aligned our 50th birthday with Pentecost, which is 50 days after Jesus' death, uh, where we're going to look and, in anticipation into what the Holy Spirit's going to do. But on the first Pentecost, that first celebration uh, uh, or gathering or feast after Jesus' death, we see something significant happen, and it's reported in Acts 2. An event happens where the Holy Spirit com comes upon 120 people, and they're filled with the Spirit of God. The room that they're in is filled with a sound of a mighty rushing wind, and little flames appear on the top of each person. I can't imagine what that would look like. But they begin to speak in other tongues, and it says, in, the, um, in terms of Peter's interpretation of this situation, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. What this is saying is that the gift of speaking on behalf of God is now transitioned from a few uh, anointed special people to everyone. Men, women, old, young, high status, low status, everyone can receive the Spirit of God and speak on God's behalf. So for us, this is one of the key teachings that we believe as a Pentecostal church. We believe in the reality that God still is speaking to His people on a different level to Scripture. We believe that the Scriptures are complete, the canon of Scripture that we hold to is the same as all of the other uh, uh, Orthodox churches in the sense of recognized churches hold to, the standard Bible that you can go by, whether it's the English Standard Version or the New King James Version and so on, not the ones that have other books, like if you've got the side attachment of the Book of Mormon, there's a slightly different translation and so on, but we won't go down that space. But what we believe is that the stuff that it says in the Scriptures is what, the same as what we can do today, not at the same level in the sense that we're going to write it into the Word of God, but at of the same significance, God speaking to his church and his people today. And then Paul understands the gift of prophecy in this way, that when people hear the word of God, they are built up and they are encouraged. And so we see that in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, the one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. 
The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Verse 12, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Verse 24, and if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he's convicted by all, he's called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he falls on his face, worshiping God. And I just, give me one second, sorry, fat fingers. Yeah, worshiping God and declares that God is really among you. All of us are called to the ministry of edification. That means encouragement. That means building each other up. All of us are called to try to encourage each other with the wisdom and insight that the Holy Spirit gives us. So even just taking some, the time someday to say to someone, you know what, God loves you, is an edifying thing to do. Or even noticing the ways that they're serving in church and coming back to them and saying, you know what, I appreciate what you did there, can be prophetic in nature in terms of building someone up and encouraging them. Every single one of us is called to be at least an encourager filled with the Spirit of God in order to do so. So we can all be prophets. But let me just say, don't assume that you're a prophet simply by age. I've hit an age status now. I'm 60, so I'm going to become a prophet. Or I am now so senior in the church that I should now be called a prophet. You'd never have me saying to you, I'm a prophet. I know how to encourage people prophetically. I even know how to sometimes prophesy, but I wouldn't say I'm gifted or anointed as a prophet. I'm anointed as different things, but not that. But it, prophecy is not, I'm the most important person in the church, therefore I'm called a prophet. No, neither is it a space where we do church discipline, and I'll talk a bit more about that in just a few moments. But for us, prophecy is part of the picture. Prophecy is such an important encouragement to people, but it is not the whole. It says in Scripture that love is the most important. And so you see in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, as for Prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, they'll pass away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect has come, the partial will pass away. But love is a thing that will never end. Um, and so for us, we recognize that prophecy is part of the picture, and it's a helpful part of the picture. But it only has its fullest meaning for us when it comes from a place of love and sits alongside other things like godly wisdom, good biblical teaching, learning how to read the Bible for yourself and hear from God for yourself. And so prophecy, while we want to lift it up, we don't want it to become the most important thing that we look for. Sometimes people are so obsessed with a prophetic word that they will go to every possible prophet in their life or some in other cities or some in other nations in the, in the hope that they might get a word from God. It's a small but significant part of the way that you can hear from God. You can hear from God for yourself when you read your word. You can read from God, hear from God yourself when you exercise wisdom. But who can prophesy we've looked at? But the second thing is, how do we test them? It's really important to remember that there is uh, integrity associated with the prophetic ministry. Um, so in De Deuteronomy verse 18, it says, The prophet who presumes to speak uh, a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord hasn't spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So what this is saying is the mark of a prophet, first up, is does it come true? Does what they say actually happen? And because of this integrity piece, actually you see that it speaks of the word death there for prophets who speak in the name of the Lord, but it doesn't come true. But it's so important that we recognize because of this integrity piece at the center of prophecy, that there has to be an integrity that's transmitted to the prophet themselves. 
So my friend Artie Kendall, uh, he, he's, he's really hard out on this. He says, if you need to say, thus saith the Lord before your prophecy, you're already wrong. Already sit down. Don't give it. Because there is that which we can say, thus said the Lord, in Scripture. But today, because we prophesy in part, know in part, and we don't necessarily have the full maturity to be able to say, this is what God is saying. Instead, recognize that to uphold God's integrity, to not impeach God by you making false declarations, and your own integrity, by the way, don't say, thus said the Lord. Now, we know there's people in the room who've done that in the past, and we're not going to go back over every word and say, well, was this God or not? But going forward, listen, please stop saying, thus said the Lord. I believe, thus said the Lord, and the Lord would say to you, the kind of standard old school prophetic demonstrations, that stuff has its place in history. But for us, in terms of integrity moving forward, let's not use that. Second piece is, does the prophecy invite you towards the Father? It says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams among, arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, if he says, let us go after other gods which you've not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words that prophet or, of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commands and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. This is significant. What this is saying to us is not only does it have to come true, but it also needs to invite us into closer proximity to the Father. And this is really important for us, that if a prophet or someone with spiritual gifts comes into your life and starts telling you stuff about you, be careful. Because if they start to lead you off into a corner, if they start to lead you off into their own little world, if they start to lead you off into the space that they're leading, they're separating you intentionally from the will of God. God watches for us to be discerning. And so that's why it's important for us to consider today what it means to receive a word. Now that said, I do want to pause here for a quick moment and say, these two things are the standard which the church should be held to, and particularly in the area of prophecy. And the reality is that in many ways, the church has failed the church, not universally and totally, but in many ways. Perhaps when we start to hear about the words, a prophet, you remember the sensitivity you have in your own heart. You remember when someone came to speak to you on behalf of God, or so they said, but the words did not come with love. The words came with condemnation. It says in the same scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. But the, the person who's spoken without love, even out of their strong prophetic gift, can cause untold damage. So I'm conscious that in the room, some people will have had a pastor, a leader, come with the condemnation of what they said was the word from God, but it wasn't. Others of you have received the word of the Lord, but from someone with a controlling or a coercive spirit. And I know that this has been an issue in this church in the past, and I've seen it in other churches as well. Can I say to you, if a pastor or leader has been responsible for coercive prophetic ministry or bringing a word without the loving tenderness of the Father as a leader in this house, I'm sorry, truly sorry. Because these words can so lock us into what is not the nature and heart of God, what is not his intention towards us. If the word failed to invite you towards the Father, there was something wrong with it. I'm conscious there are people in the room today whose very callings, whose very life destiny has been set on the shelf because a leader or a prophet didn't know how to handle the word from the Lord. And my prayer is today that you'd understand that there's a real distinction between the way that God speaks 
and the way that people speak. And there's a real distinction between perhaps the things that you've done and where you've been, but the power of the Word of God to release you into your calling, not to hold you into brokenness, not to hold you outside of the call of God on your life. Some have been told you'll never be able to serve in church. Some have been told you, you, your work is of the devil. That wasn't God. God releases us to serve him in a deeper and more profound and powerful way. Can I just pray in this space for a minute? Father, I just want to lift up those that have received words they were masquerading as a word from God, presented as a word from God, but were not at all. And Lord, those that have taken those words to heart and stepped out of ministry or stepped out of the place of callings and just sat down in a seat, Lord, I ask, Father, that you'd lift that burden from them and instead show them the possibility of a fresh word for their life, a word from the living God, a word from our Father who is in heaven, who loves us dearly. Lord, bring them into a fullness once again, of what you've intended for them. And Lord, the long-reaching seeds that have been sown as a result of that demonic word spoken, Lord, cancel those words instead. And instead, Father, bring life and hope and courage in Jesus' name. If you want to talk to me after with the service, I'd love to talk with you. If there's anyone that that's relevant to, I'd love to spend some time with you, help you in that space. But you see, there is such a significance with how we then give a word from God. We want to make it possible for people to be courageous and actually share what they believe God is saying, but to do so in a healthy way that does not set the recipient up to fail. So I would just add this shift in our general understanding. What you'll often hear when a prophet now gets up to speak is say, this is what I believe the Lord is saying, but if it makes no sense for you, just chuck it out. And, you know, Aaron said, he joked about this last week, he was like, you know, I'm here today, I'm gone tomorrow, so if you've got any complaints, they'll all be coming to me, I'm sure. But the point is that um, it's easy to do that. I'm going to give you a word and chuck it out if it makes no sense. And for him, we don't expect him to come back and start to work these things through. He's living in a different city. But if you are a prophet aspiring in the house, a nuance that will help shift our responsibility is saying how can I partner with this word wherever possible? If I'm going to give a word to someone, how can I be part of its fulfillment? How can I be an encourager? How can I be a prayer warrior? How can I be a blesser to help someone flourish with this word that God is giving them? Because prophecy is about encouragement. It's about building up the church. It's not about making you look good. It's not about making it seem like you've got a spiritual gift. It's about seeing people developed in their own personal faith with God. Second thing on this is that it's important to recognize that we all need to set a permanent guard against giving words in the area of hatches, matches, and dispatches. What that means is in these emotionally charged, highly invested spaces, do not go in there with your prophetic interpretation. When we were pregnant with Luke, we had equal amounts of the church, 50-50, it's a boy, it's a girl. I'm like, well... Half of you are wrong, and the other half of you are just guessing. But the reality is, when it comes to hatches, birth, don't prophesy it's a boy or a girl, especially if the parents don't want to know. First, it abuses their right to choose not to know, but second, you look really stupid if you're wrong. So just don't do it, okay? But also, just be really cautious for the reason that, you know, our words can have power. You can frame things up in a way that's not helpful for that child when they come into the world if their parents are given the wrong word in that space. Second, matches. Please don't prophesy to someone about their partner. You know, you are going to marry you over there. Um, and please don't prophesy to people when they're going to leave this world, okay? Because that's just not helpful. I've got a funny story about this. You know, because we had this rule against um, telling people or prophesying about who's going to marry who, one guy took things into his own hands, a friend of mine, and one day he was brushing his teeth, and he had just starting, started 
dating this girl, and he wanted to shortcut this, you know, the situation. He wanted to just get to the end. Am I going to marry her or not? And so I don't know how he was talking to God in this moment because he was brushing his teeth. But, but he was saying to God, God, is this the woman that I should marry? And just as he's gazing out the window, this bird came and landed on a branch. He's like, oh, is that you talking to me, Lord? God, if this is really the woman I should marry, let another bird come and land on that tree. And lo and behold, another bird came and landed on the branch. And Lord, if that really is the person I should marry, let that bird sing. And of course, they break out into beautiful song. If that's the way that you decide that you're going to marry someone, you don't deserve to be married. (laughs) And they didn't ever get married. I think they lasted three dates. Now, I've got so much to say in so little time. Um, If you're giving a word, first up, it's really important that we can grow in prophecy. We don't start out, thus said the Lord, and you should never get to the point where you're thus saying, saying the Lord. But we can grow. And the way that we'd encourage you to grow is start with encouragement. If you're going to be giving anyone a directive prophecy, that needs us as a leadership team to recognize you as having a prophetic gift for the reason that we're responsible for this church in terms of pastoring and leading this church. We don't want anyone giving directive words that is not accountable to a wider body. And third, if you're going to give encouragement plus exhortation or discipline, you are not allowed to do that unless you're under the covering of this church from a leadership point of view. We do not want people to be hurt with a prophetic ministry. But how can you frame it? You can frame it by being respectful, by not speaking in definitives, but journeying inquisitively and going on a prophetic journey with people. That means asking great questions. I, does this word X, Y, Z have any significance to you? I had a picture of you. Do you mind if I share it with you? Not I had a picture and I'm going to tell you about it. Um, also, recognize when your flesh gets involved because your flesh inevitably will get involved when you're giving a prophetic word. I once got so annoyed that every time we got up at church and gave a word, the same three people replied, even if it was nothing to do with them. They were just so hungry for God. So one time I actually got a really clear word about someone who was called to a trajectory of preparing for ministry uh, in, in the area of medicine. And I was giving this word, but I was just trying to stop these three people from coming up. And so the caveat that I added was, and you're already in the space of training. And actually, I knew that was me. I knew that line was me. That They could have been before the decision to go down. They were trying to figure, do I go to uni or not? They could have been in that space. But the fact that I added, and you're already in the training space, meant that no one replied. And I was wrong in that way. Okay, So it was a learning point for me. We've got to recognize when the flesh comes in. Second area the flesh comes in is when our empathy is louder than what God is saying. So we might try to overpromise how God is going to respond in a situation because we feel the pain and hurt of a particular situation. So that's giving a word. Let me say us quickly on the receiving a word because I won't have time to come back and preach this for another few months. So I hope you give me some grace. Um, if you're going to receive a word, I want to encourage you to start with a prophetic notebook. Get a, your pad uh, on your phone, your notes. Get it out and start making notes when someone gives you a word. Or better yet, record it using the voice note. But if someone comes up to you and says, can I share a word with you or can I pray for you? I want to encourage you first, set a guard on your heart immediately. See, a guard allows entry to trusted people and blockage to non-trusted people. It's important that you have that filter over your heart. It says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Don't just jump in and be like, yes, you got a word for me, please give it to me, I'm ready. Set a guard. And I want you to ask two questions in this context. The first is, who are you? Who are you as a prophet? Do you have a right to speak into my life? A question that's relevant here, where are you accountable? A genuine submission to God is manifest in a genuine partnership with the local community. So if you've got a wild prophet that is not under any community or under any leadership, 
automatically discount what they have to say. You don't need to hear what they have to say. But you'll have to stand there politely and at the very least say, thank you very much, I'll pray about it as you leave the conversation. But as you leave that conversation, I want you to ask God, what are you saying to me for this, with this word? And often what you'll find is a prophetic word that's given through someone else is a reinforcement of something God has already been speaking to you. So in your heart, weigh what he's been, what they've said in line with what you already know. Now, I'll give a quick example on this. I went to a life group just before I moved to London, and this lady had a full-on manifestation word. She was like, oh my God, and oh, I'm seeing these pictures of you, and like full-on sweats and everything. And you're on a, on a train with faceless, nameless people, and they're all just crowding in on you, and you need to not go to London. This is like my first time going to a life group after like five years out of church. I'm like, what are you on about, crazy lady? But also, parked everything she said. Because I knew from God that I was supposed to go to London. I knew that that was the next step for my life. I didn't need anyone to prophesy. I was like, this is where I'm going. And this word actually would have unseated me from my calling. That's why I was just touching on that earlier. It's so important that prophetic ministry can lead to people's destinies being fulfilled or not. So what is God saying to you in this space? And if it doesn't ring quite true, feel free to shelve it. And if... In the future, God prompts you to bring it back out and pray over it. Feel free to. But if it makes no sense, write it down and park it and say, one day, God, if that's you, you'll come back and speak to me. How do I respond? If someone gives you a word, there is a part for you to play. Some of you are sitting on five or ten prophetic words that you've received in your lifetime doing nothing with them. The first thing you need to do is perhaps to not be afraid. Maybe some of you are waiting for those words to be fulfilled, but you've put fear as your God, not God as your God. And the the fear that you have is choking the life out of the word that God has given you. So don't be afraid, but also start to say, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to respond? And sometimes when we need to move faster, sometimes we'll need to move slower. I I get so frustrated when when God gives me a prophetic word because I know that it means it's going to take longer. I'm like, oh, I just want to do it tomorrow. Please, can I do it tomorrow? No, no, this is going to happen in five years' time. This is going to happen in 10 years. Oh, I'll have to slow down again. But some of you will need to speed up. Some of you are waiting till you're 60 before you start living out the Word of God for your life. You need to be doing something today in response. All right. I feel like I've said everything I need to. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this church. I want to thank you for the openness of people's hearts to the Word of the Lord. I want to thank you that you've got a purpose and a destiny for each one, even if it is knowing the word of God for ourselves. There's nothing more precious than the scriptures because they point to the ultimate word, Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us out of your word. There'll be times when in the scriptures the word comes to life. There'll be other times when we really feel uh, encouraged to share words and pictures with others. There's times when people will come up to us with words and pictures. But Lord, as we respond to your prophetic declaration and re- as we respond to your purposes, Lord, help us to be open-hearted to what you're doing. And Lord, I do thank you once again for those that need freedom from the words that have been spoken over them. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that instead you'd lead them once again into your purpose, your plan for them. In Jesus' name, amen.